So I have sent out invites um, to our Discord, and now I'm just going to send one out to Facebook. So, um, Elizabeth, if you want to um, introduce um, Matt and uh, begin the kind of process, I'll, uh, <laughs> no pun intended there, um, <laughs> we can begin. Okay, that sounds great. All right, welcome everyone to Philosophy in the Spotlight. We're so glad that you've joined us. Um, so basically what we do here is we spend the first half of the hour, um, myself, Elizabeth, and my co-host, Christopher Sator, um, sort of uh, asking questions and letting, um, you know, whoever we've invited speak. So today we have Dr. Matt Siegel, which we're really excited about. And then we'll turn it over to the audience and you all can and ask your questions or give any sort of thoughts that you have. And uh, yeah, so be thinking about that as we are sort of having our conversation on the, in the first half. So um, thanks so much, Dr. Matt Siegel, for joining us. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing quite well. Excited to be here with you guys. Thanks for, for having me. Yeah, for sure. So Matt Siegel teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He is the philosopher, he is a philosopher of philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. You might know his YouTube channel, Footnotes to Plato, where he has over 1,000 videos there. Um, he, as far as I know, and you might correct me on this, um, specializes in Alfred North Whitehead, or at least, um, you know, you have a long history with uh, Whitehead and process theology uh, slash philosophy. I came to know about him uh, through the theology. Uh, and so Matt has published papers, presented specifically, um, you know, I would recommend watching his conversation on the YouTube channel of the Cobb Institute in their series Conversations and Process. Um, that was really, that's a really great one. And he's published a book called Physics of the World Soul, Alfred North Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology. So, um, and anything else you want to add to that, Matt, you definitely can. So um, first I'll ask you though, um, maybe you can tell us how you became interested in Whitehead and then also maybe give a brief summary of who he is and uh, maybe a bio and tell us what process theology slash philosophy is and which term I should be using. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's a very kind introduction, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's safe to say most of my research uh, and uh, teaching is focused on Alfred North Whitehead. And I was first exposed to his ideas actually by uh, Terence McKenna, who may be familiar to some people listening. He's sort of, uh, Timothy Leary called him the real Tim Leary when they met. Um, though McKenna, unlike Leary, was, uh, he had a preference for psilocybin mushrooms rather, rather than LSD. But he's kind of a psychedelic philosopher. And in college, I was listening to a lot of McKenna's lectures. I think half of YouTube is is populated by McKenna lectures. Um, and he drops Whitehead's name here and there. Um, and just what he said about Whitehead's philosophy being um, organic and evolutionary and taking time seriously. Uh, McKenna was the first to introduce me to the term concrescence. And so... Uh, I was probably in, like 18 or 19 at the time and didn't study Whitehead um, sort of formally until graduate school a few years later. Um, Whitehead is, uh, is a British mathematician and, and philosopher. Um, I think we could say scientist as well. He was contributing to uh, physics, uh, mathematical physics in the... Um, 19 teens as Einstein's relativity uh, was breaking onto the scene. And, uh, but his philosophical work's actually less uh, well known. Um, sometimes I say he's a British uh, mathematician and an American philosopher because he did his philosophy teaching and, and writing mostly in the United States after Harvard University invited him uh, to take up the 
professorship there. Um, so he went from one Cambridge to another. Actually, he, he taught in London for a few years after um, teaching at Cambridge for 20, 20, 20 or 25 years. Um, but his later philosophy, his natural philosophy and his cosmology is um, really beautiful, I think, and, and deep. And I've been studying it, um, gosh, for almost 15 years now, and it continues to kind of reveal new facets of itself to me. Um, I never get bored reading one of his books. Uh, I know, Elizabeth, you were working your way through process and reality uh, on your YouTube channel. I saw maybe about a month ago. Uh, I really yes. enjoyed that. And uh, you're brave, you know, for diving into those deep waters um, by yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I um, I started with the end. Sometimes I feel that reading um, some really challenging, difficult uh, philosophers uh, backwards, their their works backwards, kind of helps me because they they sort of conclude all of their major ideas and get to you know the heart of their argument at the end. So I really enjoyed um, part five of that. Yeah, it's not a bad place to start. Um... And, you know, you mentioned process theology, and I think uh, some would say it is the theologians uh, who kept Whitehead's books in print from, you know, the time of his death to, uh, you know, more recently when there's been this huge, uh, I would I would say, almost a renaissance um, or just a um, really an explosion of interest across various disciplines, not just philosophy, in, in Whitehead's work. Uh, but it was the process theologians, you know, people like Charles Hartshorn and John Cobb Jr. and David Ray Griffin and others um, who were trying to show how Whitehead's work was relevant, um, you know, not just to uh, those who continue to take religion in some form seriously, but who were maybe a little bit more progressive or... Uh, willing to open uh, open more inquiry into the nature of religious dogma and the nature of, of, of God and um, bring God closer to the world in some sense and to our creaturely existence. Indeed, in, in Whitehead's process theology, God is a creature uh, like us, uh, maybe unique in some ways, but nonetheless, Whitehead wanted to see uh, God as subject to the same sort of... Um, metaphysical descriptions and categories which apply to all the other creatures in the world so uh, it's a very creative form of theology but you know as i said um, nowadays you're just as likely to find physicists and um, biologists uh, and uh, artists and uh, architects and so on interested in whitehead as you are uh, theologians and i think that's great news yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. That was a great, um, that's a really great introduction to him. So I have, um, I guess I have one main question and then uh, another question um, that leads into something in your book that I was rereading re actually this afternoon. So, um, and I know this is really important to you because um, as Elizabeth had introduced you as a, as not only just a philosopher and um a professor, but you're also a content creator, and and you've you've had videos out for um, probably ten years. And I don't know if most people know this about Matthew, um, but Matthew gets <laughs> involved in debates with physicists, multiple scientists, chemists, um, people that are doing cog sci, um, and he crosses. I would say I think in your book you call it transdisciplinary. I like that term. Um, and I like that you're able to overlap with philosophy and science, and I think that's what philosophers should be doing. I think philosophers should be discussing with scientists about the, you know, all of these wonderful concepts. So my question to you is, what is Whitehead's philosophy of organism? And from your book, you state, according to Whitehead, one of philosophy's most important roles in our age is to serve as the critic of the abstractions of the specialized sciences. And it follows that philosophy is not one among the sciences with its own little, sorry, it follows that philosophy is not one among the sciences with its own little scheme of abstractions, which works away at perfecting and improving. 
Instead, the philosopher must always be at work attempting to harmonize the abstract sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and psychology, sociology, and theology, both internally among themselves and more generally with our deep spiritual intuitions and aesthetic feelings regarding the archetypal values inherent to the universe. So that was a long quote, sorry. Um, so uh, what is Whitehead's philosophy of organism and how does the philosopher um, integrate themselves into this integral uh, nexus of philosophy, theology, the sciences? Uh, that may be a hard, that may be a, um, a big question. So I apologize if it was too big, but I wanted to get some of your book in there as well too. Yeah, I love I love all of that, um, Chris. Thank you. I'll try to just jump in the middle of, of that. I mean, the question, what is the philosophy of organism, um, is I'll just start there and then I'll touch on transdisciplinarity and, uh, you know, what philosophy's role is um, in dialogue with the special sciences, because you're, you're right. I, I mean, debate, yeah, but I, I hope I'm respectful and acknowledge that... Uh, well, I should say, you know, I, I am, um, you know, endlessly uh, fascinated and interested with science, all of the, the sciences, and continue to learn from uh, actual scientists. And I, I, I don't like to think of myself as a critic of science as such, but more so um, I like to engage and challenge some scientists when they maybe... Um, unwittingly start to do philosophy and, and uh, make metaphysical claims uh, that they really think that they're putting forward as, as scientific claims. So, um, but I'll, I'll circle back around to that. Um, Whitehead's philosophy of organism is, is uh, a phrase that uh, he uses in process and reality, though I think the first time he, um, I mean, he, does, he explores this notion of organism as a kind of general category to apply across all scales in nature in, in his earlier book, Science uh, and the Modern World, that was 1925. Um, and then he goes to Harvard um, just as that book is being published. And then he's invited to give the Gifford lectures uh, at the University of Edinburgh and the, the le Gifford lectures are on natural theology. And he originally gave the title, uh, The Philosophy of Organism. Um, but of course the book that came out of the Gifford lectures ended up being titled process and reality, but nonetheless, it's this concept of organism that Whitehead's really inheriting. Ultimately, you could say from Kant's third critique, uh, and the German idealists, um, Whitehead's not explicit about this kind of lineage, but he's clearly drawing on the romantic tradition and, uh, this organic conception of nature that, um, you know, our, one of our, other favorite philosophers, Chris um, Schelling, really uh, advanced um, in uh, the late 1790s, early 1800s. And Whitehead's inheriting this view of organism, not just as, um, you know, a way of talking about biological uh, creatures, but, you know, uh, more a cosmological principle, something that's operative um, at the level of uh, hydrogen atoms, and stars and galaxies just as much as it is operative at the level of uh, cells and plants and animals and so on. And the basic idea is, you know, rather than conceiving of nature as a collection of parts, atoms say, um, really we should reimagine nature as a collection of holes. Nature is made of holes, right? So uh, it's self-organizing at every scale and they're sort of nested. Um, it's a kind of holarchy is, is a great term for it that um, uh, Arthur Kersler developed, uh, I think in his book Janus um, in the mid 20th century, but the idea instead of hierarchy, it's holarchy, so that nature is this like nested series of um, co-evolving holes, right? And so you never get to a base level of nature that would be just a part that sort of, um, that exists side by side with other parts and interacts only through blind collisions rather. Uh, nature is this fully animated and sold uh, process of evolutionary creativity, right? And so a philosophy of organism is uh, whitehead, I think, uh, I mean, how I describe it in my book really is 
he's taking Schelling's philosophy of nature and uh, updating it with quantum and relativity theories and um, making it compatible with Darwinian evolutionary theory, but also tweaking that theory to, you know, bring purpose back into um, the natural world. <clears throat> so he's he's a he's a Schellingian um, to the bone, I would say. I I love the. I love. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, oh, Elizabeth, no, go, I'm, go ahead. I love. I just love the. I wanted to read the the next paragraph because, um, I mean, it, it hints at the name of the book and and what I love about it. And I mean, we we're supposed to talk about Whitehead, but as I was reading your book today, I mean, this is, it's all about Whitehead, anyways. You say, after all, the data associated with humanity's religious experiences and artistic expressions are also integral aspects of the becoming of this cosmos. And that's exactly what you were just talking about, about this um, kind of holistic uh, hierarchy. I don't want to say hierarchy, but you know what I mean? This this kind of organism um, that, you know, overlapping. I think Whitehead's term is prehend. Uh, I'm not I'm not so great on the, the Whiteheadian lingo, but uh, I really liked that that passage. So it kind of like that that helped along with the definition that you presented. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. I'm going to have to get your book now. Um, I'm convinced. So, um, yeah, I, I love that. I, I just think that, you know, these kind of ideas of being holistic and looking at dynamism and um, kind of softening our approach in the relationality of things um, and beings can really foster a sense of of love and uh, and respect for for everything in our environment, which I think, you know, in our world that some might feel is is increasingly or too divisive or politicized in terms of ideologies and just the the pressures of everyday life and the pushing and pulling that um, it Whitehead seems to offer and I don't know if he would agree with this by this articulation but he seems to offer a more sort of I don't know maybe like a healthier relationship or a more productive and and salvific kind of alternative to um to sort of maybe more dominant or normative assumptions yeah that's well said um you know there's this i think something that's typical of modern um kind of post-enlightenment philosophies of nature is this, this this sort of moral stance that we we need to um, accept that the universe doesn't care about us and that um, beyond what we construct within the context of our human social and cultural life um, there is no meaning there's no purpose and you know nature is just there for uh, for us to to exploit and yeah we may want to learn about it but ultimately it's an, there's an instrumental purpose behind that learning and why does you know, in his book, Science in the Modern World, there's a chapter called The Romantic Revolt. And he takes seriously the way that um, romantic nature poets uh, were attempting or rising up in resistance to this um, mode of thought that would depict the human as somehow alien in the universe. Uh, and that universe as nothing more than a uh, very complicated machine. And so, you know, that's a very unhealthy way of looking at the world, I think. Um, and the diagnosis, um, maybe a few hundred years ago, wasn't, wasn't quite as, as clear, though. I mean, you see it pretty quickly in, in London when the Industrial Revolution gets underway. And this sort of philosophy of nature is kind of applied. Um, but now that you know we're a few hundred more years into this, um, I think <laughs> the symptoms of... Uh, that kind of a worldview are patently obvious um, to most people. And so Whitehead's offering an alternative view of nature and of a human being within uh, the natural world that I think does um, lend itself to uh, what a, a more empowering and yeah, a healthier view of what, what, what our role here is as human beings. Um, so it's it's not just a matter of you know, his view being truer, which I think um, we could certainly make a case that it is truer of the scientific evidence. But I think it's also um, 
it, it's it's connecting us to some sense of the good and the beautiful as well. So his philosophy is beautiful, but that's not because it's not also true. Um, it's integrative. He's an integral philosopher, I would say, in the sense that, you know, for him, um, truth is is an important value, but but so is being able to to lead a good life and and a meaningful life and a beautiful life. Yeah, I I love that. So do you think that, um, you know, for someone who's starting to study Whitehead, um, you know, it's it's a good idea to kind of look at these transitions or these turns that he makes. Um, Because I think we've we've kind of mentioned some, right, going from parts to the whole or going from machine to organism. So um, have... Is that the way he is usually kind of thought about or one way we could think about him as as maybe categorical transitions or turns? And if so, um, uh, what are uh, maybe some of them that we can we can think about aside from what we've already mentioned? Yeah, I mean, definitely the shift from mechanism to organism, but also uh, from substance to process uh, and uh, not just process, but sometimes he's called a process relational philosopher. And so the emphasis in his uh, understanding of reality is uh, the interdependence of, of all creatures um, and the, the way in which the universe is constantly passing beyond itself such that um, no, no moment ever repeats itself. Um, the universe is constantly growing and uh, internally differentiating, you could say. And so he'll talk about this in terms of the incompleteness of nature. And every perspective we might take on the world uh, is really a perspective on the past. And uh, that past has already perished. And the uh, creative unrest of you know, things continues beyond. Um, and so you know, he applies this to his own philosophy that we need to keep our our thinking um, open-ended and resist any uh, dogmatism or, um, you know, resist uh, or, or avoid what he called the fallacy of the perfect dictionary, as if we could, you know, finally uh, catalog everything there is to know about the world and how it works uh, in, a, in a single, between two covers, uh, as it were. So I think, yeah, the process dimension of his thought is really important. Um, and the, the relationality, I think, it's not that he wanted to um, reduce individuals to their relations. He certainly did not want to do that. Uh, but in a um, tradition dominated by the idea of substance, the Western philosophical tradition, uh, Whitehead emphasized relationality, which is very difficult for uh, substance ontologies to explain. Um, because, you know, as Descartes defined a substance, right, it's that which requires nothing but itself in order to exist. And so Whitehead's trying to balance that out by emphasizing relationality. But for him, again, it's not that individuals are reducible to their relations. It's that individuals grow out of their relations and then add something new, some new way of valuing uh, the relations out of which they arise. And so ultimately, you know, he's balancing uh, this notion of um, individual self-enjoyment and creative achievement with uh, the idea that uh, what, what the individual does to become themselves is uh, gather up everything, uh, all their relations to every other creature in the world and to the entire history of the universe uh, and take some new perspective on that, um, add, some, add some new value uh, to that community. So it's really a uh, balance between the individuals and their communities, but um, again, he's emphasizing the relationality because it's been so downplayed uh, in the Western tradition. So, yeah, process and, and relations, I think, I would add to your list. Um, okay, so I have a, I have another hard question for you, um, and it's going to come from a passage from your text. Um, and if you don't own um, Matthew's text, Physics of the World, um, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology. I highly recommend getting it. I was a strong, mm, I mean, I liked Whitehead, but I kind of resisted it. It was Matt, after having multiple, multiple discussions with Matt, um, 
I, I've slowly been turned to the Whiteheadian process um, side. You say Whitehead coined the term concrescence to refer to the production of novel togetherness. And this is in terms of the solidarity of the universe. And it's resulting from the satisfaction of each occasion of experience. So I wanted to know what's the difference between something like actual occasions, which Whitehead brings up, and eternal objects. Is that too much, or am, am I? I... <laughs> well, no, it's, that's, that is a fantastic question. And, okay, thank you. Uh, I hope I can answer it in a way that is um, meaningful. These are two categories from Whitehead's um, metaphysical scheme, the, the two most important categories, right? Actual occasions... Uh, and eternal objects. Um, so actual occasions are the concrete realities that actually compose the world. Uh, our experience is always comes in the form of actual occasions. So you know, what we think of as our personality, say, is, is really more like a stream of occasions that intimately inherit from one another. Whitehead calls these societies of actual occasions. And so, you know, most of our everyday experience is um, somewhat removed from these these two basic categories, though when you get down to doing metaphysics to try to describe what, say, you know, the stream of your conscious experience really amounts to, and um, when, you, when you start to incorporate our scientific understanding of the physical world and the physiological uh, aspects of our own organism and so on, um, you need these categories, Whitehead thinks, to, to make sense of it all. And so um, actual occasions would be uh, the most uh, concrete way to, to grasp the facts of nature as they unfold, right? And so um, eternal objects then are the, the characteristics uh, that we use to describe those facts of nature. Uh, and so we're always describing the facts of nature in, in terms of forms, um, abstract forms. And for Whitehead, this, this realm of eternal objects, as he refers to it, is a sort of, um, it's a field of potentiality that is um, infinite in, in scope and every actual occasion of experience is, uh, he says, ingressing or drawing upon, you could say, this infinite realm of possibilities uh, and selecting from that infinite realm of possibilities some finite set, some definite uh, constellation of them uh, to, to value and to bring together or to concress, right? So his term concrescence is the description of how um, from moment to moment, what the universe is doing is sort of uh, drawing down from infinite possibility to some finite actual fact, um, which arises, experiences itself, and then perishes to become part of the past universe inherited by the next moment. And so it's you kind of have to think of it like a uh, the two poles of a magnet. You need the pole of potentiality or eternal objects and the pole of actuality or actual occasions. Uh, to operate as a kind of dynamo by which uh, new creative achievements uh, are, and realizations are brought forth in, in the course of uh, cosmogenesis or the, the course of the universe's unfolding. So, um, yeah, he, always keep in mind that Whitehead's not positing a, a duality. Like, he'll, he'll say you can't even imagine what an eternal object or the realm of eternal objects is uh, without taking some perspective on them in the context of an actual occasion of experience and vice versa. You can't really even begin to describe what an actual occasion is without drawing upon these, these definite forms, these eternal objects in terms of which you characterize that actual occasion. And so um, let me give one concrete example and then I'll stop and see if any of this makes sense uh, to you, Chris. Um, when we, experience a sunset. It's obviously um, a temporal, it's an event which, which is occurring, right? The, the sun is going down and we, we witness it in that few moments when it's right on the horizon and the, 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 the color is, um, is radiating in, in all of its splendor. 
And the red that we see in that moment, Whitehead says, oh, that's an eternal object. That color is an eternal object. And he says, it haunts time like a spirit. It comes when it's needed and then it disappears, but it can come again. And the possibility of the next day witnessing a sunset, oh, there's that red again. You can say, oh, maybe it's not exactly the same red, but uh, Whitehead says that, you know, we can spot particular shades of color and we can see how they recur, right? They're called upon when they're needed and by our experience. And that th this evident fact in our experience is part of what leads Whitehead. I mean, he's also a mathematician, so he has other reasons for thinking that there might be something like a realm of eternal forms. But um, the, the, the fact that certain um, qualities or subjective eternal objects or like red or color can recur um, in different experiences. For Whitehead, this points to the reality of some type of realm of eternal objects. <clears throat> so there can be qualitative eternal objects like colors, sounds, tastes, emotions even, uh, but there's also uh, the mathematical form, uh, the geometrical form uh, that people maybe usually think of. Uh, these are kind of like platonic forms, but there's some important differences. Um, I mean, chief among them that unlike some readings of Plato, Whitehead really values uh, actual experience, the actual world of concrete events. Um, he values that over the realm of abstract forms, which he says they're deficient, um, whereas Plato tended to give preeminence to the forms. Uh, Whitehead kind of inverts Plato in that sense. Actually, you're, that was a, a beautiful answer because, a, as you know, I was I was in Florida uh, around the same time that you were there, and there was this one occasion where um, where there was a storm, like a massive storm, and and then it, it was going away, but also so it was like two sides of the same city where there was the massive storm, and then the sun was shining, and then there was this like cloud that was blocking the rays of the the sun. And so you could see this red and orange and pinky and purple colors that were emanating from this one cloud. So like that example of the, the redness as this possibility um, or yeah, um, that hit home. So thank you so much for um, your answer. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful. It's it's almost as if, as if Whitehead is um, kind of giving us a call to um, uh, to awareness and to a shift in our attention to um, to sort of to notice and seek after and maybe even attend to um, to the earth. Um, I think the sort of the example of the sunset is really is a really nice um, segue into uh, you know something I was wondering if you could uh, just briefly touch on and that's the um, ecological sort of vision that he's, uh, he's led some people to in sort of um, understanding and, and caring for the environment, sort of like, yeah. So, so I don't know, because I, when I, whenever I read sort of the biography, I guess, of Whitehead, they always mention the ecological aspect, and I don't know much about that. So is there anything you can uh, let us know about that? Yeah, I think that's partially why his work is experiencing a, a bit of a renaissance now or interest in his work is increasing is because of the ecological uh, catastrophe. Uh, people are searching for uh, more holistic, um, life-affirming philosophies to, to uh, and, and anti-mechanistic philosophies to, to try to um, diagnose what went wrong and, and provide alternatives. Um, but, you know, his understanding of nature as uh, intrinsically valuable, in, in other words, nature realizes its own values independent of human values. Now, not ultimately, ultimately independent because everything's interrelated, right? But um, Whitehead would say that our human sense of what's valuable is derived from the values of, uh, I mean, first and foremost, the ecologies of, of the planet Earth um, that sustain us and out of which we emerge, but also the values of the broader uh, cosmic community um, of 
you know, the other planets the, 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 in our solar system, the star that we orbit around, um, values are being realized by these, as most modern people would normally think of them, merely material uh, entities. And Whitehead says there's no mere matter. These are all self-organizing processes that have some um, value for themselves. And so even if human beings never existed on this planet, uh, value would still be uh, being realized by the course of events of just, you know, snow forming on mountaintops and uh, melting in the spring and, and rivers rushing to the ocean. That's, for Whitehead, that's an aesthetic event. Whether or not any human being is there to see it, um, and so that type of a, of a worldview, right, I think, um, calls human beings to, to attend to the, in, to the impact that we have on, um, the theater of nature, if you will, uh, and to question whether it's really just a stage for our, uh, performances in a kind of anthropocentric way and to maybe recognize as Whitehead puts it himself in process and reality that. You know, we find ourselves in a buzzing world amidst a democracy of fellow creatures. Uh, and so he's quite literally calling us to um, expand our sense of the community um, beyond just the human community. And uh, certainly we have a lot of work just to, uh, you know, establish that community um, and, you know, getting over racial and national boundaries and stuff. But beyond even that, uh, we are members of a community of life and we depend upon the health of the ecosystems uh, that we live within. And so, you know, he was well aware of this a hundred years ago when you had to be paying a bit more attention to notice the direction that things were headed. I mean, <clears throat> as I said, the, a lot of the romantic poets, Blake and Wordsworth and so on were already um, aware much earlier of uh, what this sort of industrial mindset and the mechanistic worldview was doing to the earth, but um, Whitehead still was ahead of his time in this in this sense. That's really lovely. That um, reminds me of uh, this lecture that I that I watched on YouTube by Andrew Davis, and he was talking about some of these ideas of Whitehead. And one of the first ideas that he brought up was this this turn from exception to exemplification, which I think really speaks to what you are saying that, you know, one of the dominant sort of um, assumptions, I think, in in the history of, of our species has been, well, at least for a certain, certain time period, has been seeing kind of a humanistic understanding of our species and feeling as if human beings are an exception to what uh, to what's out there in the world, to nature, um, which kind of presupposes, uh, you know, I don't know, a privileged sort of understanding or egoistic understanding of our of our species. But if we can think of ourselves as just an example of, uh, of the many, many examples and manifestations of what exists, then I think that that, you know, that also leads to sort of the um, I guess the the invitation to relate to everything and each other and ourselves differently. Yeah, here, here. I um, I wanted to ask one one more question, unless Elizabeth has another question. Um, this is a quote from Whitehead, but it's also leading to a question. It says an individual or an actual entity that progressively emerges through feelings and the attainment of satisfaction for the philosophy of organism. A subject emerges from the world, a superject rather than a subject. I was wondering, since we were talking about this, like um, this solidarity within the universe, this this kind of um, this nexus of of or concrescence. That's the better word. The concrescence of of relational beings together. Um, is the superject his way of, I guess, moving away from the kind of mechanized Cartesianism of metaphysics? Um, if so, is his point to show, is to express that relationality? Or am I completely off, <laughs> off the cuff here? 
Yeah, no, that's, um, I mean, it's such an important uh, reversal that Whitehead um, uh, uh, achieves in, in inheriting, and he is inheriting Descartes. He has a lot of positive things to say about Descartes. Uh, and, you know, he has criticisms. And, you know, he's inheriting Kant as well. And, you know, he talks about uh, modern philosophy as part of the turn toward the subject. Um, and then it, it's a real discovery that uh, the metaphysic, the metaphysician has to, to take seriously, that um, all of a sudden subjectivity is at the center of our inquiry into the nature of reality. Whereas, you know, um, you know for the ancient Greeks, for example, that was like, they wouldn't have even understood what, what the hell that meant. Um, and Whitehead thinks this is an important shift, but it's too anthropocentric the way uh, Kant and, and Descartes and, and those modern philosophers uh, make this move. And so not only does Whitehead um, generalize subjectivity beyond just the human, such that, you know, again, every uh, at every scale of nature, the uh, entities that we might um, want to point to as as concretely existing have, in some sense, an interiority to them. They have experience. They have self enjoyment. They have value, right? Um, but he, what he does to reverse the normal vector that you see in um, in Kant and, and Descartes uh, from the subject to the world, and the world, you know, in this you know a caricature pre- uh, presentation. I know that every philosopher is deeper than the quick caricatures we can give their position but in general it's fair to say i think that the kantian or cartesian orientation says that you know the the subject and our subjective experience uh is what's most real and that the the world out there the objective world is in some way or another an appearance in our soul right and um there's the constructive activity of the subject is given sort of full reign over the universe whitehead wants to say that actually the subjective experience that we enjoy is uh, an emergent product of that universe. And so um, for Whitehead, the process of concrescence, it, it begins with the already actualized, you could say, objective world or a whole um, collection of already actualized objects. Uh, and concrescence is the process whereby that multiplicity of objects grows together and is guided by what he calls a subjective aim and many subjective aims that un- that, that grow towards unity. Um, and at the end of this process of concrescence, there's a satisfaction, which is the achievement of that unity. It's, a, it's an aesthetic synthesis and an aesthetic satisfaction, a sense of enjoyment and the achievement of, again, like some novel value and perspective on things that's never been before. And that, uh, it's a reversal in the sense that you're moving from objects to a subject, and as soon as that subject is satisfied and achieves itself, it perishes. In, and this is the superject, the perished subject. Um, but it's not just that the superject is then dead, right? The superject is really the expression of the aim that took form in that concrescence. And so, you know, the, the way that purpose and um, will and and uh, what we would call final causation or teleology operates in nature for Whitehead is precisely by the subject achieving its its aim and perishing and in that superjective form after having perished uh, affecting the future and being in some ways um, we could say resurrected in the future by the next occasion of experience which receives uh, the superject uh, from the prior moment right so the first moment of concrescence is as the multiplicity of objects that's really a multiplicity of superjects too and whitehead's use of these terms subject object superject um we need to put them into motion in a way and and realize that um from one point of view what i describe as an object from another point of view is a superject and from yet another point of view is also a subject it just depends at what uh phase in the process we are trying to uh describe right so hopefully that all made sense and uh, wasn't a tangled, garbled mess. <laughs> no, no, it was it was it was absolutely excellent and thank you and very and, and I, just a, a beautiful definition and um, explanation as well too. Yeah, I think so as well. It it really just by, I mean, I think the assumption um, of our limited perspective that you know we can only behold 
the information that we derive internally apart from what we see around us can be quite pessimistic and self-defeating. Um, so I like this idea that we can, that there is the possibility of constantly shifting our positionality to, to maybe see a different angle, um, to step outside of ourselves, maybe even if that's possible, um, to, uh, to kind of engage with the world around us in a, in a different way. Um, but I think that our audience is probably um, wondering when we're going to turn it over to them. Um, so what do you think, uh, Christopher and Matt? Is it okay if we if we start um, allowing everyone to ask questions or say something? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Yeah, I think that I think that would be great. So if you do have a question or a thought for Matthew, all you have to do is um, select it should be on the left hand side. It's a green button that will say request. You just request to talk, we'll accept, and uh, you can unmute yourself and we can you can ask your question or bring up your thought to uh, Matthew. So feel free. Everyone's a little shy at first. But then, you know, <laughs> once the first person dives in with the first question, everyone's like, all right, it's my turn now. Right. That's so true. I mean, yeah. And even if sometimes it's hard to think of a question or you don't have a question, but even if you uh, want to share your experience with Whitehead and what ideas you find most liberating, I think that's, that's really helpful. Oh, and we have, we have our first, uh, we have our first speaker, our first questioner. Hi, my name is Angel Nava and I want to thank you all for your thoughts and uh, your time in putting this together. Um, I had a thought when Matthew was talking about the, I don't exactly know that. So I'm a physicist. I'm not a philosopher. I don't know the jargon, but the idea of like these forms existing and like manifesting themselves. And I like the switch from Plato to um, Whitehead where like the manifestation is what's, I guess, given more authority. And you see that a lot in particle physics, right? So something called like the group theory. Um, these groups are kind of like numbers, right? The concept of the number one exists um, outside of the different manifestations of one finger, one person. And these groups are also like thoughts in God's head, I guess, but they govern, for example, the strong force. Um, and that would be like what in Whitehead's view, I guess, is prioritized, right? These groups can be represented as matrices and that allows us to like look into this other world, but the matrices themselves are not the group. It's just like a shadow of the group. So I really like that thought. Um, and I had a question. So this principle of like self-organization that you were talking about there's the concept of like or how do you how do you reconcile like within humans right we we self-organize and we seek our best interests but there's also like a side of us that is self-destructive i mean that's kind of what's going on with our um a lot of modern day problems right um what what do you like how do you interpret this if at all levels there's a self-organizing structure, is there also like a self-destructive, self-corrosive structure? And how does this fit into like the talk that y'all were having? Wow. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, in religious terms, the problem of evil basically is what um, you're asking about. And that's indeed how, how Whitehead frames it. Um, so for him, theodicy takes on a very different form because whitehead's god is not all powerful um so whitehead conceives of the divine as this kind of persuader um <laughs> a persuader in chief you could say who can try to lure uh other creatures toward what is most beautiful by sort of holding up a mirror to each creature reflecting to that creature its unique greatness and what's possible for it but as finite creatures we often more more often than not fail to live up to that um sort of 
Imago Dei in, 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 within us. Um, but nonetheless, it's there. And to the extent that there is a cosmos at all, it's because that lure um, has been persuasive. Um, but of course, there's lots of destruction. There's, there's decay, there's death. Um, I mean, Whitehead points out this seeming paradox in the evolution of life on Earth that over the course of billions of years, uh, organisms with comparatively deficient survival value have emerged. Um, so if it's all about survival of the fittest, as I mean, that's Herbert Spencer's rendering of, of Darwin's sense of the struggle for existence. Like, that's there's got to be more principles at play here than just that, because otherwise, I mean, Whitehead jokes that um, the Earth would have remained uh, in rock or mineral form, because, you know, rocks live or, or persist, at least for millions of years. Um, so that there have been many cases of uh, organisms of a great complexity uh, that have evolved, even though that they're, they're sort of, they live less, uh, they live um, for less time than uh, simpler organisms in many cases. And so that suggests that there's another principle at play, which is this, this urge for life, not just to survive, but to live better, when it says. Um, but the source of, of destruction then would be uh, a result of uh, just a, it's sort of a byproduct of creativity um, in the sense that in any given moment we can draw upon. I loved your characterization of the sort of realm of, um, of possibilities, bringing in a little bit of physics and a, the concept of a matrix, a, ma uh, a matrix, uh, and matrices is helpful. And like you said, this is even the, our mathematics is a shadow of that realm, but. When Whitehead um, conceives of this realm of possibilities or eternal objects, uh, it's it's a a sort of um, uh, infinite potency available in each moment that we can draw upon in ways that might always might not always be in congruence with the habitat that we exist within or that any organism exists within. And so, when Whitehead refers to evil as novelty in the wrong season, um, which is to say. Uh, too much creativity, too fast, or that it's not in um, resonance with what's going on around it. And, you know, often what seems evil initially and really disruptive to its, say, social environment or its habitat uh, in the longer term ends up being a sort of agent for change by which uh, greater complexity could arise. And so, um, you know, there's a way in which even evil deeds or just destructive deeds, if, if you don't want to use that religiously charged term, um, can end up contributing to the emergence of something more complex later on. Um, so, you know, Whitehead tries to fold destruction itself into the creative advance. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's still worries we might have about whether this is ultimately satisfying, but I think it's at least an improvement on um, traditional uh, theodicy as at least, you know, the, the Western Christian uh, world has tried to, um, you know, re respond to the problem. Yeah, I think that's really beautiful novelty in the wrong season, because I think sometimes, you know, I think, Sometimes philosophers, I feel, go a little too far with trying to justify or explain evil or suffering. And I think that's very, it can be quite challenging for people who are in the midst of that or recovering from that suffering or tragedy um, to sort of always do that. So to recognize that, um, though we're not just going to blanket over evil or suffering with, you know, it'll turn out to be positive because of our resilience or we'll, we'll have some growth from it or you know it's it was there for a reason i think is is also we also have to create a space for um for for, for not not always submitting and and accepting 100 percent the evil and the suffering that we're encountering That was awesome. I just wanted to say something just before um, we let our next speaker, Eric, talk. Um, Matt, I was thinking, as you were talking, I was thinking about 
um, the comparisons between Schelling's idea for a philosophy of nature and like the beginning stages of that text, um, Schelling talks about the first move into consciousness, the first move, the contraction into interiority. And that interiority, um, you know, is what separates us from the world. And so essentially what we need to do is we need to like, we need to connect back. This is the bridge to freedom. So like, this is the idea of the subject and the object coming together or mirroring each other, or one becoming implicit while the other is explicit or consequence and antecedent. So it was interesting that a lot of the problems for, let's say, evil or a lot of the problems for um, issues that we have are this this idea that this this kind of condition that we have of compartmentalizing and turning things into mechanism or, you know, in the 16th century to 18th century where we turn the new scientific object into, you know, we try to turn that object into the world or turn the world into that, sorry, into that scientific object. Not that I'm bashing science, I'm not. But anyways. Yeah, so Eric. Hey, can you guys hear me? We sure can. Yeah, excellent. Perfect. Yeah, because I was, uh, I wasn't too sure about the settings. It's actually my first Twitter uh, space as well. So. <laughs> Well, welcome. Thanks. I'm glad you're here. Uh, well, it's good to hear your voice, Matt, again. Um, my question is basically, uh, I guess because you were kind of fishing around online. I saw it on terms of, uh, in terms of your Twitter feed there, you were looking around for some work that Rorty had, had done on, or Richard Rorty, on um, the Whitehead. And um, I, I, I had no idea that, uh, Rorty had actually done his graduate work on Whitehead. So my question to you is, I mean, maybe you can go and kind of just kind of narrate the story a bit to that in terms of that, that <laughs> how that kind of happened or his work on Whitehead and your, some of your thoughts on it. But also, I guess, in terms of where you see Whitehead kind of fitting in, uh, if at all, within pragmatism or his relationship to, to American pragmatism in general. Yeah, good questions. Hey, Eric. Um, hey. So Richard Rorty, as a graduate student, was um, studying Whitehead and uh, studied even with um, Charles Hartshorn, uh, who I mentioned earlier, process theologian. Uh, Hartshorn studied directly with Whitehead um, at Harvard. Uh, and so you could say Rorty is, you know, that's he's in that lineage. Uh, but of course... Um, despite his early flirtation with Whitehead's philosophy, and he, he studied it quite deeply, his, his master's thesis, um, which I recently found and, and, and read and enjoyed, um, published in 1952, I believe. It was called uh, Whitehead's Use of the Concept of Potentiality, I believe is the title. Uh, so already his, his pragmatism is there in a sense, He's worried about the use of this concept. Um, and he explores uh, eternal objects and the nature of God. And um, after that, though, you know, Whitehead, uh, Rorty rather gets infected with, um, you know, Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's philosophy and the philosophy of language and really um, leaves the, the whole notion of um, speculative philosophy behind as just a fool's errand uh, and a, a, a result of con confusion, uh, confusion about how language is to be used. <laughs> and, um, you know, so he also, you know, was drawing on pragmatism. And I think, um, you know, Rorty is uh, obviously a seminal figure and important, and I don't want to discourage people from studying him, but I think where he ends up is um, not in my view, you know, we were talking about healthy philosophy earlier. I don't think it's a healthy point of view. It seems very relativistic, nominalistic, and uh, truth kind of becomes, as Rorty put it once, not jokingly, what your colleagues let you get away with saying. And um, that doesn't seem like a, yeah, a, a helpful philosophical position to me. Whitehead is also, though, trying to inherit the pragmatism of you know, William James and um, John Dewey. And uh, you could say Charles Saunders Peirce, though 
Whitehead only became aware of Peirce uh, pretty late in his philosophical career at, at Harvard. Hartshorn was actually editing Peirce's papers um, and uh, let Whitehead know, or actually gave Whitehead one of uh, Peirce's essays. And uh, Whitehead read it and was shocked by how, how much convergence there was in their thought and, and asked Hartshorn, Hartshorn to... Uh, uh, if he were asked later to confirm that Whitehead was just seeing this now because he didn't want to be accused of plagiarism or something. Um, but, you know, Whitehead's pragmatism is, let's say, um, reformed. He, he didn't want to reduce philosophy uh, to a kind of instrumentalism. He, he wanted to be able to preserve uh, the, the work that um, imaginative rationality could do. He, he, he says himself, he contrasts his own work to, to Dewey um, by saying that he's still a rationalist. Whitehead still wanted to pursue a kind of um, mathematical uh, form of, of, of thinking um, to search for the mathematical order of the world, and he thought that, that the human mind was capable of this. Uh, he wasn't a foundationalist, though, and so Dewey is really worried about that whole project. Whitehead shares the rejection of foundationalism with Dewey, and he experienced it firsthand with the uh, failure of the Principia project, the Principia Mathematica, with with Russell earlier in the century. Um, and you know, as as I was saying earlier, Whitehead does think he says, "As we think, we live." Right, very pragmatic statement um, by Whitehead, and that the sorts of ideas that we entertain they shape our our lives, they shape the type of civilization and the, 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 the shape of our, our society and of the values that inform uh, politics and economics and, and everything. So ideas do have an impact on the world, and, and Whitehead was quite well aware of this, but uh, just didn't quite want to let go of um, the possibility of realism, right, as opposed to nominalism. And certainly, while language is something Whitehead took some time to think about, um, he didn't think that language was this sort of cage that we exist within. Um, and, you know, Rorty would often just make fun of the idea that we could ever, that we, that we might think of language as somehow pointing to a world beyond itself. Words point to other words for Rorty, right? But no, for Whitehead, Whitehead can say things like uh, language halts behind intuition, and that we can, um, we can intuit truths that we don't yet have the words to articulate right that would be something that whitehead would say and for rory that's nonsense if you can't say it you don't understand it um so you know i i would um want to affirm whitehead's form of or maybe reformed form of of pragmatism rather than the extreme uh form that it ends up being dragged um uh, into by rory so yeah no, well, because I guess I'm fascinated. Well, because I know how much you guys are all into German idealism as well. So I guess it's, it's you know, where I guess Whitehead fits, you know, kind of with, because he fits between all these different schools, yet he never really identifies with one. I mean, he leaves his home in, in Britain. I mean, he's not really a Brit anymore. He finishes off his life in America. And I'm not sure if he would ever really go out and kind of consider himself ever to be fully American, even at the end of his life. So he's, you know, a really interesting figure to me, uh, historically, you know, like in terms of how he fits into that whole mix. So when I saw you bouncing around the, uh, uh, cause I, I just had no idea that Rorty, you know, had done his graduate work on that, but I guess it makes sense to me now since he studied under Paul Weiss up at Harvard as well, who's a big time pragmatist and his, thinking had a major influence on a lot of people. And technically, if I understand correctly, he was a colleague, I think, of Whitehead at the time as well at Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah. Um, Weiss was writing about Whitehead pretty early on. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, I guess, if there are any Rory stands uh, listening, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I was I was just about I was just about to say that I've heard enough of Rorty already. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No doubt. Yeah, but I, and I guess maybe just in terms of your thoughts, I guess in terms of him and his relationship to German idealism, 
uh, Whitehead's relationship there. Because, I mean, well, I guess it's it, or even British idealism, maybe I should say. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts where you think he, he falls more into that camp rather than the more American pragmatist camp. Yeah, I mean, it might be one of the reasons that Whitehead's books were kind of on the shelf for a while, again, besides the theologians. Um, but he he's not an analytic, even though he, with Russell, you could say helped inaugurate analytic uh, philosophy with the Principia, um, he's not really an analytic philosopher, but nor is he a like continental philosopher or phenomenologist or something. And and so, you know, he's he's engaging in this grand style uh, cosmology in the middle of the 20th century, just as logical positivism is really taking off. And, you know, Wittgenstein is saying of, you know, of that which we cannot speak, we much we must remain silent. And Whitehead's trying to speak unto that silence like like a madman, um, you know, trying to to grok the ultimate nature of, of the universe and come up with all these uh, uh, obscure categories. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes say it's, you know, I can't claim to be a scholar of German idealism because I, I actually uh, don't read German fluently at all. So um, it's nice to have an uh, English language philosopher like Whitehead to dig into, but um, sometimes some, some people think he's not actually writing in English uh, either. So, um, but in any event, yeah, it's, uh, he's hard to place, but if you read um, F.H. Bradley's, the German or the uh, British idealist book, um, Appearance and Reality, uh, you'll see a lot of um, resonances with Whitehead's thought. Uh, Whitehead even says in the beginning of the process in reality that you could say that his philosophy of organism is just um, absolute idealism sort of re-imagined re, uh, in, in a realist kind of way, a realistic kind of way, and a more empiricist kind of way. And so he's he's very close uh, and yet really resists the the idea of everything just being an appearance in the absolute whitehead his you know this is one way his pragmatism and, and empiricism radical empiricism come out is that he he doesn't want to resort to explaining away any uh of the salient features of our experience of our common sense experience any philosophy or science that ends up explaining away uh you know something like our our own individual sensory perspective on the world um, by reducing it to uh, some um, absolute substance within which, you know, our particularity just dissolves. You know, Whitehead wants to resist that. And so I think he was worried. He admitted to not really reading Hegel at all, to not really, uh, it's unfortunate. You're going to maybe not like uh, Whitehead as much anymore, Chris, but in his Harvard uh, lecture notes, uh, his, student notes that have recently been published uh, apparently he referred to the catastrophe of german idealism <laughs> and i'd have to go into why he says that and it's definitely a function more of ignorance um than anything else and i try to address this in, in um in my book a little bit and in some of my other publications to correct whitehead on that um, but i but, think that uh, i think that makes sense though i mean just just because of he's coming out of a time where he's working with Russell and a time where Hegelianism has, I mean, not real Hegelianism, you know, French Hegelianism, but also, you know, British Hegelianism that has kind of just sweeped across with its claims of, of absolute knowing and you know, the abstract idea of, of the concept and stuff. So it makes sense. It does make sense that that would be, you know, um, without grounding a philosophy on an axiom or a first principle or moving towards a philosophy of organism, why that would be problematic. So no, I'm not taking that um, in any way. But if, if anyone else has any other questions, please, you can just hit the request button and jump um, and ask a jump and ask <laughs> a question for Matthew. <laughs> can I do a follow up if there's no one else? Yeah, go for it. Oh, sure. So there's this move in like Latinx mythologies to reconcile like the death and life, death, nature of the world. And Matthew, you said like God in this Whiteheadian sense is like this principle that beckons us toward order. 
is there any like in your thought or in his thought was there any ever is was there ever any like reconciliation attempt between like these so so i i'm thinking about like chaos and entropy right these would be disorder and things that we would i mean deem as like evil probably in human terms i I know there's more insidious evil it's harder to reconcile this way but in physical language right we need entropy for the possibility of new information like you were saying right otherwise the world would just remain a rock um so yeah that's my question was there ever any attempt to reconcile like because i guess the way you described god as like in, in the process form it feels almost like then this entity's within a bigger um logic and i mean i guess i would want to say that bigger logic would then be god but i'm not sure if the make this if this makes sense i i'm not as familiar with whitehead or these concepts but yeah that's that's the question yeah i mean so whitehead's god is um has two poles just like every other actual entity um that that part of of god that aspect of god that beckons us uh as you put it which i love um is the primordial nature of god and then there's the consequent nature of god um which is god's uh reaction to how the community of of creatures composing the cosmos uh God, it's God's reaction to what they decide to do in light of that beckoning. And so God in the consequent nature is, uh, Whitehead says, a fellow sufferer who suffers with the world, um, all experiencing every, every pain and every joy uh, with the world. Um, and, you know, God as a creature, it's a kind of unorthodox theology, no, no question about it. Um, it takes that omnipotence away from um, from God and, and, and from religious believers who might have leaned on this notion of an all-powerful power, God to, um, you know, give them some sense of, I don't know, strength or, or orientation or feeling of invincibility if only, you know, they are on the good side of this, <laughs> this, this all-powerful being. Um, and that kind of, that, that anchor of omnipotence i mean it's been part of many of the uh, monotheistic traditions um for millennia and to pull that away it, it does um i mean it's it's in a way it's whitehead making groom for the for entropy right it's it's that the then disorder and the um the way that time really does degrade and and ultimately destroy all things nothing endures forever except in God's consequent nature. Um, because that's, that's, that's like the cosmic memory that not only remembers everything that, that happens, but remembers it in its best light. Um, and this is why Whitehead would, would say and does say that uh, the highest form of beauty is tragedy. And um, that, you know, the universe isn't moving towards perfection it's in a way um, perpetually failing to to attain perfection because that would be some static frozen uh, form but rather it is in some way um, the the eternal or like the, the primordial nature of God this perfect vision of what could be is always present with the world even in its darkest recesses um, there's still some, you know, flicker of light there that uh, holds out the hope for uh, something better in the future, and so um, you know, it's it's a, it's a very different form of uh, of theology that um, makes a lot of orthodox religious believers very upset. And it, like you're saying, it's like that's not God. Um, God's a creator, not a creature. Uh, but for some of us, it's it's actually easier to to connect and and almost um, reimagine some of these monotheistic traditions. Uh, I mean, you know, for for me, growing up in the 
in the U.S., it's it's Christianity that is most dominant culturally, and and to be able to look at that, the symbols and and um, the story of, of forming that tradition through a Whiteheadian lens actually breathes breathes new life into it for me. So, yeah, yeah. I guess for me, it's it's also like, well, where I am currently, it's not necessarily just that this God would suffer with us in many ways this God creates the suffering and um, allows these things or, I mean, creates entropy, right? And with what you're saying, it makes sense, right? Uh, I liked your quote earlier about creativity and like um, n- something new at the wrong time was destructive or I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you said, but um, you still do need that destructiveness for creativity, right? And you still need in some ways i I guess we as a whole have a we we kind of move away from the concept of death for example but in many ways death allows new life right it's this entanglement of both the creative and the destructive nature um at least that's where i am currently but yeah i don't know yeah yeah, thanks for your question um and it's deep you know, and I, I can't pretend to adequately address these sorts of questions, but um, you know, hopefully there's something there to give you a new perspective on it. Um, maybe we could do like one more question and then. Uh, sure. Yeah, I was I was thinking that we're, we're getting down to that time. Because we have been we have been firing a lot of questions at you for the last uh, hour and a bit. So, uh, yeah, I, I need to go catch the sunset. Uh, I saw time, but there you no, go. No, no tremendous rush. But let's maybe I'm do one more if anyone's. Yeah. <laughs> well, if there are none, um, you know, this is a probably a, a good spot maybe to to stop and and to thank you for coming by and for sharing your thoughts and being put on the spot for an hour. Um, Elizabeth and I love doing these spaces and these spaces allow for people to tune in all over the world and to engage in philosophical discussions. And like today we had, you know, we had our friend Eric here, you know, our friend, our our physicist friend that came in and and joined in. So, and and other people listening as well. So it's a a wonderful opportunity to have, you know, uh, well, well well-informed scholarly individuals to come and discuss with, with everybody, you know, um, enthusiasts, academics, students, scholars, non-scholars. So, um, yeah, so thank you so much, um, Matt. I mean, I'm always happy to talk with you and always to, ha- always to have you here. And um, if you don't know about this, Matthew is doing a, a directed, not a directed reading, sorry, I'm in school mode, um, is doing a reading group right now on the German philosopher and anthroposopher um, Rudolf Steiner. And so if you, if you go on to, um, I'll, I guess we'll post, um, Elizabeth, we'll post all the links for his Patreon so that people can join yeah. the reading group. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It should be really interesting. I know I will be there. I think Chris will be there. I am super excited. I've never read any of Rudolf Steiner. So this will be my first time, but I love the opportunity to kind of discover someone new. So um so yeah so that's great well yeah and thank you so much matt you are absolutely welcome anytime i really feel like this particular twitter space had sort of a like a sacred kind of energy and i really i really appreciate that so um any last uh things you want to anything else you want to say to us matt as we leave anywhere to you know to follow you or uh any suggestions for the audience if they want to start reading whitehead um yeah anything at all well first just to thank both of you um i appreciate the work that both of you are doing not only with this uh philosophy in the spotlight uh, twitter uh endeavor but on your youtube channels and uh, your other philosophical work um you're leaving the internet better than you found it uh, which is not true for a lot of people so thank you and uh, it's been wonderful to be in dialogue with you and and uh, everyone else, um, thanks for mentioning the Rudolf Steiner reading group. We're, we're reading a book of his on the history of philosophy uh, called Riddles of Philosophy. 
and um, we're kind of hosting it on a patron patron page, but it's totally free unless you want to give a gift. But you know, we just want to be in dialogue with folks. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in Whitehead, um, it's kind of hard to say where to start with. But if if you want to dive into primary material, I'd say start with Science and the Modern World, his 1925 book, and um, go from there. But um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go catch that sunset and uh, bid you all farewell. It was a lot of fun. And if, you, if anybody here gets a chance to read um, Matt's Physics of the World Soul, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, it's a fantastic book. It's not very pricey and it's, uh, it's worth... No, no, it really is worth the read. I reread it again today and I, I made sure I had some quotes and some passages because um, I'm, I'm not a Whitehead expe- expert, so I wanted to make sure, you know, we... We highlighted some of your work as well too. So let's I'll let you go and jump and watch that um that sunset and thank you for being here. Yeah, thank I'll you. I'll send pictures. Good evening. <laughs> okay. I hope so. Right. And, and yeah, and for the rest of you, we'll be back here next week. So just, you know, keep following Christopher and myself and uh, we'll post the link and we'll let you know who what conversation we'll have next. So thank you everyone. Yeah, and just just one more last thing. <laughs> Um, we also have a, a Twitter um, account now for Philosophy in the Spotlight. So if you want to follow that as well, um, I'm I'm kind of hoping that <laughs> that Elizabeth and I can use that as opposed to our our separate accounts. Um, yeah. Anyways, thank you very much. Um, we'll have this up on the YouTube if you missed parts of it, or you can also see it on my feed to rewatch the recording. And um, wish you all the best and. Uh, Yep, keep thinking philosophical thoughts. All right, bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Later.